Dale. Welcome to episode number 24. We nearly, nearly approached the quarter century of um, Aimless Ramblings. And I was thinking, you know, for this topic, we've had far too much cohesion. So I was hoping to pick one that might, you know, be slightly more divisive. And I mean, is there ever a more contentious topping than whistleblowing? So I'm going to toss straight off the bat to Tim. Uh, let's see what we got. Well, thank you very much, Sam. I'm going to just start off with a little bit of theory, and I'm going to caveat to start off with a lot of this is original, and by which I mean I am somewhat drawing from some official definitions, but largely this is just my own sort of reflections of the matter. So feel free to call bullshit. So in terms of the public and the private sphere, there is obviously a fairly large division. And the issue is always where that gray zone exists, particularly when we start talking about, for instance, the private versus public sector, as opposed to, for instance, the private and the public sphere of interest. Now, privacy has links to what I would call secrecy. And the issue of whistleblowing is intimately tied up with both of these two topics. So privacy in my conception, besides obviously the legalistic definition, is really the issue with regards to the individual versus the greater society, whereas secrecy has to deal with information held by an organization within a broader society. When we start talking about whistleblowing, whistleblowing is when there is a secret, so information that is held by an organization as opposed to a private information which would be held by an individual, which if held by that organization could do harm to the broader society and polity. Now, this is where I think it gets interesting in terms of secrecy and privacy and whistleblowing. Whistleblowing as a as an idea seems to me only really to have legitimacy when you're dealing with secrecy that is to the greater harm of the society. But when you're talking about the greater harm to the society and when a whistleblower makes that decision, uh, kind of realistically, you're talking about a position where an individual is making a choice – to leak this information and they're not necessarily doing it with – they haven't got this information then put it through a rigorous process uh, generally because the process that they're putting it through is corrupt in itself or has a vested interest in hiding said secret information. So it is an intensely personal decision made on behalf of a broader society. And, and the issue is, is that for whistleblowing, depending on how wide you draw that, that boundary, like is that boundary – the single state? Is it a nation or a, a group of nations? Is it a global community? Like at what point and where do you derive the standards by which this information is causing harm and what level of harm uh, is acceptable before you need to start calling the whistle, uh, well, blowing the whistle on it to, to, you know, to use the name? But really, I suppose the question that I want to ask both of you, is do you think that whistle like secrecy and the definition of secrecy as you know a a, a piece of information that an organizing organization keeps safe from or, or keeps hidden from the broader society because it protects their own interests, whether that be you know a state interest of a particular collection technique for intelligence or a trade secret which keeps it uh, you know competitive in in an international uh, you know, uh, arena of commerce, uh, is, is the decision by the individual to reveal that secret, can that ever be rigorously drawn like in a scientific line or is it always going to be a bit of a fuzzy standard? And so I'll, first of all, I'll throw to Sam. Um, interesting. Uh, you singer out an individual as not um, being able to have secrets because, you know, um, say you have, one individual within a public organization, just to use public because it's um, you know, what we most think about when we think of whistleblower, and this individual is acting corrupt in their office. Um, you know, that's not a privacy issue or you know, a secret. You could probably call it a secret by, you know, if you call privacy the right to have your personal life private and a secret something that's, you know, 
more broadly withheld or whatever, but um, you know, I would say an individual could definitely be having secrets, and it doesn't have to be an organization holding a secret. Because, you know, say you've got the local mayor, right? Takes bribes on the side from Joe Blow, the construction company. That's an individual case of corruption, and they have that secret as an individual. Thoughts, Tim? Uh, I'll take it up to begin with, and then I'll throw it to Simon. So this is, I suppose, the issue with the semantics of it. So I was trying to really think of an effective way to delineate between the private and the public sphere and the individual and the organization. So I think in terms of a usable term, secret is better in an organizational function as opposed to private uh, with, with kind of private information. So for instance, an individual's privacy can be waived or, or, or can be violated by a broader society on the consensus of like a criminal investigation or something along those lines. So um, if that individual had committed a crime in a private capacity, then I think that's, that is really clear cut there. But what are, what are you talking about there where they're actually embezzling or using their position of power or their position within an organization, maybe it's better to define it as like with regards to secrets, you're talking about the release of information pertaining to an individual within their office as a member of a like an organization as opposed to in their capacity as a private individual. Once again, I definitely I definitely think that the semantics of this isn't necessarily as important as the utility like do do you think that even if like the secret or if it if it's a privacy like the individual making the decision to leak that information like they do, is there is there going to be a point at which like that person has obviously committed a crime and trying to cover it up that's a pretty pretty uh easy example <laughs> but uh you know when there's aspects of you know mild corruption or influence for instance i don't know uh in a third country where there isn't necessarily laws against it, uh, making use of traditional gifts so as to gain access for an Australian company to exclusive mining rights to a particular area. Would you would you say that is something that could be or needed to be whistleblown on or whether or not that was something that might be seen as an unsavory practice in Australia but not necessarily illegal? I think that is actually technically illegal uh, by Australian diplomatic law, but I can't remember. Uh, Sam, you get your hand up. Uh, where I'd like to draw the line is where is the protection? Is the protection on the information or is the protection on the secret? Um, I know that sounds like an odd thing, but the best way I'll describe it is the um, – I don't know if you guys will remember this, but there was a computer virus called Wanna Blue, and that came from a backdoor in Windows XP. However, that was originally found by a security individual who had – down this and rather than revealing it as a thing we're like wow this is a good way to get into people's things so he kept it and they were aware that he kept it and then his computer got hacked and it was released on the black market and was combined with a worm that allowed it to do all these nasty things and was pretty much made into ransomware so it's was the protection put on the security so the thing of being a secret is that the protection? Because if they're putting the protection on the thing, the instance it should have been released, everybody should have, they should have informed the people as quickly as possible. However, they didn't because they thought they still could salvage it in some respect. Um, so that's when I come to whistleblowing is where is the protection being put? Is it being put on the fact that it's secret or is it being put on the actual contents of the secret? And I know it's supposed to be the contents of the secrets where the protections for whistleblowing is supposed to be put, but I've seen it a lot of cases are just put on the case of it being secret or so on and so forth. Uh, do you guys have a um, response to that? Well, I do think it's interesting in terms of, I suppose, particularly when I come talking about classified material in a, in a public sense, there is a lot of stuff that is classified, but is classified on the basis of the decision of the individual analyst, operator, whatever, working it's not like it's not necessarily applied to a strict judicial review, et cetera. And the issue is, is that there's obviously obviously always going to be a bias towards over classification, over classification, because you never get punished for over classifying. So like, but you're always going to be, you know, if you over classify, people are just like, oh, just be safe, gonna make it blah, 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 caveat. 
and the issue comes then that some of these classifications come with very stringent and long-term uh, policies that sort of hold that information sort of in situ and potentially never release it to the public. So uh, I would throw to Sam because his hands up, but do you think that like potentially whistleblowing, I know Simon, you talked about it a few times and I'll throw it back to you after this, but like, you know, how criminality sometimes tests the boundaries of society in terms of, uh, you know, how safe and resolute and what is and what isn't uh, legal. Do you think whistleblowing in some ways maybe um, tests the boundaries of what is and what isn't uh, admissible to, you know, the broader public in terms of uh, information? But I'll, I'll throw it to Sam first, see if he has anything to say. Um, two things. Uh, one, um, with regard to the overseas one, if it's not uh, against the law in the country, it's not a like um, a, an offence as such. It's possibly bad practice if it's you know against the law in Australia. You know, say giving gifts to an official, but it's not um, a whistleblowing offence because it's a requirement that it's also illegal in the country you're committing the offence as such. Um, and secondary, interestingly, in the um, like protections offered to whistleblowers under the um, federal system, there's no uh, restrictions based on classification purely based on the source of the information. If it's from ASIO or ACES, you're not allowed to leak it. Oh, sorry, whistleblow it. Like, you will not be given the protections if you release that information. But say it's from the signals director, it doesn't matter if it's got the highest classification, you'd still be offered the protections, provided you meet all the other requirements. So it's interesting that, you know, classification doesn't actually, you know, like how classified something is, like Australian eyes only to top secret doesn't actually seem to be relevant to the legislation. It's the source of the material, which I guess, Tim, could be a thought to um, counteract almost the over-classification of things. You know, it's more so where it comes from that matters than what someone deemed it as. I don't know. Thoughts? Well, yeah, I, I definitely would agree with that in terms of, I suppose... The difficulty comes with as well is, I suppose, I don't want to step too much into this because Simon's going to talk about it a bit later in terms of avenues and methods of whistleblowing. But if an organization is to be healthy, it has to have some sort of like outlet by which this this kind of, uh, whether it be like a redress of grievance, uh, you know, alternate uh, stovepipes of communication. This isn't just whistleblowing, but whistleblowing, I think, forms part of this, a method by which to inform broader organization, yet let alone the broader public interest with regards to, and when I say organization here, I mean like whole of government, not necessarily just an individual department or in a private sector sense, you know, um, the chief executive officers and uh, the board of directors, not just like a particular department or, or branch. And in this sense, maybe like whistleblowing and like it, it's we've gone a little bit off from the original topic i had like in terms of you know is there a hard line because i think we've we can all agree there isn't really a hard line or, or an easy sort of mathematical solution we can make with regards to whistleblowing but in terms of the legitimacy of it maybe there is something that is built in that needs to occur with regards to a an organization being actually able to function um well anyway i think we're now drifting really into your territory sam talking about the legality and legitimacy of, of whistleblowing. Yeah, yeah. Uh, promise I didn't steer it, but I guess it just tends to flow. Um, so first and foremost, it, you're required if your organization has the, um, the framework to report it internally first. Um, however, if you feel as though the investigation wasn't given due credit or is progressing too slowly or is being intentionally stalled, you would still be given the protections to then proceed externally. So, you know, if you look, there's an internal investigation that's taken two years, I'm going to you know, go to the ABC, say. That then becomes a legitimate whistleblowing. Um, I'll start off with uh, being from the Moonlight State as such. Um, if anyone's unfamiliar, that's the title of the 1987 Four Corners um, episode that led to the Fitzgibbon, Fitzgibbon um, inquiry and eventual report that resulted in the downfall of the uh, nationals in Queensland. Um, but essentially, um, you've got the Queensland police, right? And whew, holy fuck, were they a doozy. So um, 
you know, running prostitution rings, running drugs, running illegal gambling, like all of it. And on the same time, you know, taking cash, um, subduing, persecuting, um, cause it, I guess at the moment you wouldn't call them whistleblowers to begin with because in Queensland at the time there was no framework for anyone within the Queensland police to legitimately and legally open up any of these complaints outside of the Queensland police. So you had a lot of complaints internally going up to the top, but the top was rotten, so nothing got done. Um, so you had eventually people going to the ABC and I think it was The Guardian possibly, maybe the Korean Mail, um, with all this evidence and eventually it resulted in a um, journalist called Chris Masters putting together his piece, um, The Moonlight State. Um, and funnily enough, um, Queensland police were so rotten, the AFP actually ended up putting this guy under guard whilst he was doing it you know he had a federal police officer following him around to protect him from the state police which is whack uh but anyway you know you can google the fitzgibbon report and look into it all yourself but essentially you had no system for legally venting like you kind of talking about tim but it was no external mechanism for legally venting and so this corruption just festered and festered because when the top is rotten there doesn't, there's nothing you can do about it, essentially, unless you have an external body. I know we could have a federal external body, but if you have a federal external body, you know, eventually, you know, how many checks do you need before you're confident that they won't rot? Um, thoughts? Do we guys think that, a, um, I guess, the central crux of this is, is if you are performing an illegal action, to whistleblow, in this case, the person that informed the Four Corners report was performing an illegal action. You know, it was against the law of Queensland and at the time against the state, uh, federal laws, which is why their name has never been released, by the way. Um, do you think that is a problem? Is it okay to have a whistleblower um, performing an action that is illegal? Uh, Simon, you got your hand up first, so I'll throw to you. Well, just to look at the whole entire broad scheme of, like, legality, um, the act of committing an illegal offence does not necessarily mean that it will continue to be an illegal offence. Um, for example, the uh, Jim Crow laws made it illegal for a bunch of stuff to happen, so they technically were all committing illegal acts, but that does not decrease the ability of the change that that occurred and as such retrospectively that uh, a lot of those laws have been changed. So I feel like simply by doing something illegal does not necessarily mean that it is inverted commas. I want to search for a better word, but it's not bad as such. Like, yes, there are bad things that are illegal, but are also bad things that are still technically legal. And I feel like using it being illegal as a quantifying statement of an action in and of itself is not enough to justify something as saying it is wrong to do such a thing. Uh, Tim, do you have a response to that? Yeah, um, thanks, Simon. So really drawing it back to Sam's original point there, I think, uh, and it sort of plays back into the issue I was talking about with regards to you know the mathematical you know divisions as to whether or not it's something that should be allowed or not allowed to happen with whistleblowing. Any organisation can create a huge apparatus of uh, you know private and secure means by which individuals can raise complaints, whistleblow, etc., uh, and. And you can even have it enshrined in law. But I, I think um, one aspect that we have to look at is depending on the nature of the organization and depending on the level of corruption within the organization that has occurred, um, it can become quite difficult for someone to use any other means than essentially go to, to the broader public and sort of rest uh, their 
their lives in some cases, as you were suggesting in that particular uh, incident with the ABC journalist, or more broadly, like you know, uh, put their their reputation and their careers and uh, you know their their livelihoods on the line and say to the the greater public, you know, this is what's happening and this is unacceptable by the standards which are commonly held in society. And, and and in some ways, it's it's a political act when you do that. But at the same time, I think it is kind of a final recourse. And it doesn't matter the level of criminalization that occurs. Like, um, as long as you live in a somewhat free society, and this is what I would argue is one of the the strengths of of a free society. Um, and I mean that in the the loosest sense of the term is that. If you bring the information to the public and the government and the organization or be it private or public, which which has, has done the wrong, cannot justify itself in the public sphere, then the comp the, the sort of the the consequences for them will mean that they will no longer be able to continue on that course, or at least there will be a le- some level of investigation. I know that's a little bit romantic, unfortunately, because no matter the amount of information that's been leaked in certain cases, we've seen ongoing issues, whether that be you know racialized policing or you know over securitization of certain matters. Um, but it, it's it's really a dependence upon uh, the free society in the final instance. And if it's not a free society, the potentiality for the society to revolt against the over overarching corrupt system. Uh, very romantic and idealistic, but I'd throw to you, Sam. Do you think? potentially that is like you know the the people's will is the final arbiter in matters of of whistleblowing i guess just it could be but um it interestingly kind of ties straight back to um your first uh topic you know like um of secrets you know there are we'll say i'll go with asia or asus you know they will hold secrets that are not released to the broader public for an incredibly good reason right you know the broader public benefits by these secrets being held. But if the public acts as the um, the ultimate adjudicator for what is right or wrong to have been done in its behest, how can it be doing this with incomplete information? Um, and I mean, this applies to the private sector as well. Like The government released, recently was um, either did or floated the idea of repealing um, disclosure laws for CEOs where they would have to disclose to um, shareholders any um upcoming changes that could impact their value you know so they could essentially keep the cards to their chest so that despite the fact they know the business is about to go under people will continue to invest in them or something um you know so how are the how is the public meant to hold people to account if we don't have this access and do we just have to rely on you know people in these positions going you know what me you know potentially spending the rest of my life in jail is worth me disclosing thoughts i think there's sort of a two-part balance like i'm I'm now i'm being descriptive rather than i suppose uh, making an argument here is that in a lot of liberal style societies you have an oversight of two parts you have a representative uh, like uh, sorry, elected representatives who, who form one part of an oversight committee, and then you also have an aspect of the judiciary, whether it be a inspector general or a similar position, which is appointed to sort of serve on the public's behest, and maybe something like that where you have people who are from outside the organisation. Because this is another aspect of whistleblowing, I suppose. Not necessarily all the time, but some of the time. The people are doing these things aren't intentionally corrupt. It's just that they've overstepped their mandate, or they're they're breaking their mandate or the law willfully, but in the belief they're doing it for the right reasons. And you need to have someone who's outside of that sort of hermeneutically sealed little bubble uh, to sort of bring them back onto line as to what is correct. And I suppose that's the issue: is if that you have these organisations, be they public or private, so you know boards of investors or you know CEOs or you know uh, Commonwealth officials who are completely divorced from the public making these decisions, uh, and they're not being readjusted through social interaction with others. I don't mean that they're living as like hermits, but just that their decision-making processes aren't exposed to broader society, that, you know, that that's when the, the real trouble occurs. Um, Simon? Um, 
as with every complex issue, it's it's very hard to like specifically have a black and white answer to it. Um, but I definitely feel like it's a thin line between walking, between making it an isolated, like uh, only so many people are allowed to know this particular thing, and also ma- making sure that the people who are interacting with the information, which is the secret, have the tools to actually work with it. And I know that sounds absolutely ridiculous, but it's the fact that if you don't have the context around a particular piece of information, like it's the whole entire reason why you, there's so many people that believe outlandish things because they've been able to isolate and find little snippets of information and stitch it together into a far-fetched tale. And it's you have to have the tools surrounding to understand the information that because a lot of this stuff's sometimes in like a particular jargon or it's saying a particular number, but you don't know what that's compared to. So you're saying a number, but like, okay, so what's that compared to? And you don't have that background information to be able to interact because you don't get the full, you know, background details of last year. We also had this, you get like the snippet of whatever is released and that's what you have to work with. And I think that's where the issue lies. Um, So yeah, um, so my topic is pretty much broadest things. I haven't written a full list, but in the broadest things, there's the private release of information through whistleblowing, and then there's the sort of re- releasing through the organization version of whistleblowing. Um, and there's a thousand degrees and a thousand colors between you know these two, but these are just two that I picked that are sort of like, I don't even say the hallmark, but they were just ones that I recognized. So on the one hand, you've got, if you're using the thing, the best example is the John Bartham, who, you know, beside whatever his beliefs were, whether or not he wanted to step forward in the impeachment of Donald Trump, that is beside the point. But the process of him writing this book, and he went through, and he went through the proper channels, and they all looked over and ticked it off. And then as they were about to get, they gave him the heads up, and he was ready to send it to the publishers. They're like, oh, wait, no, actually, we're going to rechange that. And because he'd sent it off to the publishers, it's like, where's that line drawn? Because he was given the go-ahead, but then again, he wasn't given the go-ahead by the same person. So it's like, and we don't know what was like told he wasn't allowed to have in that and whether it was entirely for national security or whether it was for, you know, private ego, because it was a very close issue to the person who runs the country. So it's like, "Mm." and then on the other end of the spectrum, you have like uh, the unaltered uh release of documents which happened i tried to find the guy's name but it's the guy that always gets confused for julian assange who isn't julian assange but it's the other dude who released a bunch of information which actually what snowden snowden yes uh snowden who released a lot of information uh which he felt was very important but also in the process of giving it in a complete and un filtered thing uh put a lot of people who weren't prepared to be in danger in a lot of danger i think was him or was it somebody else who released like the name of all their um undercover or like people who were you know sort of involved in particular areas that weren't particular uh tim so with regards to the snowden dump um there was there was aspects of that where you're talking about particularly sourcing. I think it was for Afghanistan for certain human source networks where they, they had like the individuals who were working with um, source handlers in Afghanistan had their names revealed, and that was the the concern. Um, interestingly enough, though, Simon, I will say, um, bringing back to your your issue with regards to context, um, they uh, they talk about how uh, you know. In that initial dump from the Snowden release, people were like, "America has been proven to be spying on, uh, you know, Denmark and Norway and a bunch of all these other countries." Uh, and actually, I'll, if you want, I'll chuck it into the uh, the thing after. But only about four or five years later of, of deep digging, it's now available and open source. Uh, it was sort of revealed like that with regards to a lot of these. Uh, countries that were being spied on, although I'm, I'm sure some of them actually were like being spied on with regards to Germany. For instance, there was a big backlash um, from Angela Merkel. But um, the issue was that actually the reporting lines were coming from those countries. That's what that reporting meant. It wasn't actually that they were being spied on, but it was actually information that was being fed to the Americans who was then fusing it and sending it back out to all these other people. So when you're talking about context, 
big one there. So when there's a big, massive rip of information in a dump, is is it really whistleblowing if you're dumping just a whole bunch of information without, you know, properly contextualizing it, or you or you just providing, you know, information which can then potentially be misinterpreted and you misused? Um, Sam, you got something to say? Um, like, I don't know it's American, but under the Australian um, legislation, it's only uh, has to be of public interest. So if it's not even a beneficial for the public knowing, it just has to be of public interest. So, you know, if there has been a, they're called disclosable um, action, which I think the NSA stuff probably would have because it involved the, um, from vaguely what I remember, never really interested me that much. It was... Um, the monitoring of telecommunications within the U.S. as well, wasn't it, without a warrant? I think there was a part of that was with regards to the ability. It was it was particularly concerning with regards to the issue of Americans or overseas or being uh, intercepted as part of you know uh, it, like doing an investigation and intercepting on one individual, but then who had links to American citizens, so you were by default collecting on that person as well. So yeah, I think that was the issue. Yeah, something like that. So essentially, you know, without a warrant monitoring the surveillance of US citizens, which, you know, technically is most likely going to be a disclosable thing. So that snippet of it maybe was, you know, and I guess it goes back to what you initially said is maybe there needs to be this almost extra party type organization or something that, you know, be it representatives from all the major major media outlets from the judiciary and from the governments and from the intelligence agencies where they can all you know sit down and actually determine what is a legitimate form of whistleblowing you know you've got the people like um assange who just think that there should be no such thing as secrecy or privacy full stop and that everyone including private citizens are fair game yeah you know, it's a bit too extreme for me but i do think we probably need to set up some form of framework, you know, like as Simon touched on something that allows it to be given in its proper context. Maybe something like a citizens council, like a, a random slice uh, selection of people from across Australia, give it a bit of a, a pub test. Now, I, I, I do know how popular pub tests are uh, with the, uh, was it the university uh, senatorial vetoes or whatever it was, where uh, members of parliament or the Senate could veto uh, certain uh, research grants, I believe. Uh, that's the Australian Research Council one. But um, Simon, you got something to say? <sighs> Seeing how well juries have gone in the past, however long they've existed, I would probably be really scared if we had that also for this, just because it's certainly your last ditch effort. If you're going to try and get a, something through, you just put it to jury. Um, so like, if you're really unsure on the context and you're like, I'm really not sure I'm going to be able to do this, you usually throw it to the jury. So it's, it's sort of like if you want to, you know, it would be the weirdest situation. You'd get stuff that would be, you know, yeah, that's, you know, on the line, you know, kicked out. And you'd have stuff that you really don't want to release, 100% released just because, you know, they thought it'd be funny. It's a really horrible situation just in juries in general. But, you know, I'm probably, you know, going to get ripped. But, Tim, yep. No, I, I agree. Well, what's the joke? Uh, would you really put your hands in the lives of a bunch of people who couldn't even get out of jury duty? Anyway, on that rather anti-democratic note, which I don't necessarily agree with, Ooh. I think that <laughs> I think that's all we really have time for. Uh, thanks everyone for listening in. It was a great topic, guys, and I hope to hear from you all next time. This great warrior has left to his martyr Lord.